we've, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today's webinar is on the far right um, in Israel, and specifically, given that the far right has won Israeli elections, we have some very special guests with us, including the editor of Local Call, Meron Rappaport and the editor of 972 Magazine, Amjad Iraqi, um, as well as my uh, partner in making good trouble, Hagai Matar, um, who I have the privilege of co-publishing Local Call with, um, to discuss about what happens, to discuss what's about to happen next in Israel and what we should be paying attention to. Um, we also hope that this webinar serves as a bit of an explainer, especially for folks who are trying to make sense of the recent Israeli elections um, and thinking as we think about what happens um, from here. Um, and so as a little bit of background for those who might be less familiar with Just Vision, um, with 972 and with Local Call, um, Just Vision um, is a organization, a, a team of filmmakers, journalists, and human rights advocates. Um, and we seek to fill a gap on uh, media coverage on Israel-Palestine through documentary storytelling, um, through journalism, and we couple um, that storytelling and journalism with uh, impact campaigns or audience, in, audience engagement campaigns that we run in American, Israeli, and Palestinian societies. Um, we had the huge privilege of tag teaming and partnering with 972 Advancement of Citizen Journalism um, to found Local Call, um, which we co-published today. Um, Given the, the work and the importance of stories um, from Israel-Palestine, um, our focus at Local Call um, and throughout our body of work at Just Vision is really to flip the lens, to look at the stories that we so often hear about in the mainstream media, not from the top down and not through narratives of violence that are so frequently reinforced in the mainstream media, but actually from the bottom up looking at what the impact of the policies are on communities on the ground um, and through that lens, also having a better understanding of what are the dynamics and potential pressure points for change. Um, with that, I'd love to turn this over to um, our co-moderator, Hagai Matar, um, to share a little bit about where we are with the recent Israeli elections and lay the groundwork for the conversation that we're about to kick off. Thank you, Sahad, and welcome everyone. It's so lovely to see people joining us from all over the place, uh, Ireland, Kentucky, Thailand, uh, Palestine, Israel, um, Germany, all over the place. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Hagai Matar and I'm the executive director of 972. Um, and basically what we're talking about today are the Israeli elections that took place a little over a month ago. Uh, the elections were, in essence, between two major political blocks or camps. Um, the divide is not around the issue of Palestine, apartheid occupation, or anything like that. Uh, the vast majority of political parties that ran for Knesset uh, have a right-wing position on those issues. Uh, the main issue that was up for elections was uh, the pro netanyahu camp, um, and which is completely on the right, and the anti netanyahu camp, which is diverse and has right, center, left, and Palestinian parties in it. Um, so, so it's important to clarify that the anti netanyahu camp is made up of these different factors. The two camps came in very close to each other in terms of the number of votes. Uh, there, there were just a few thousand votes short um, of a tie uh, or even a win for the anti netanyahu camp. Uh, yet, because of the way the parties were set up, the anti Netanyahu camp actually lost two parties that did not make it past the electoral threshold. They were very close and didn't make it through. Uh, one was the liberal Meretz uh, on the left, and the other, the Palestinian National Party Balad, or Um, And basically, that erasure of those two parties led to a landslide win to the Netanyahu camp. Um, basically, with the, the new government that is likely to be formed very soon, uh, there are still negotiations for the formation of the government, but the government that will be formed will be the most extreme far-right and religious uh, government in Israeli history, We're in, uh, oddly enough, Netanyahu, for the first time in his career, is going to be the most leftist, so-called, uh, marker, uh, the most liberal, the most secular, marker um, of all the parties making up this coalition. Um, 
And that process is uh, of forming the new government is very frightening to a lot of people who live here, first and foremost, foremost Palestinians, but also LGBTQ community, um, women and others who fear for where the country is going. With that, I want to turn to Miron Rappaport, um, an editor on local call, an analyst, longtime journalist, um, and ask him, Miron, about the far right and its role with the new government, in a country that's already dominated by right-wing politics for years, what actually is the difference between these election results and what we've had before? What is this new far right and what sort of, sort of an effect is it the elections already having on the ground? Good evening or good morning, it depends on where you are. Um, I'm from uh, speaking from Tel Aviv. Um, yes, uh, uh, the right wing is governing Israel for or for 45 years, uh, and you can say also that uh, regarding the Palestinian, uh, uh, maybe for from the beginning of uh, from 48 onwards, uh, and the the, the, um, the politics, the Israeli politics, uh, was um, against Palestinian from 48 onwards. So so made so there is a basis to say that. It is a continuation of of of, of policies uh, in the last few years, but still, I think there is a difference, and there is a, may, a, a, a maybe a major difference. I think what happened is, in a in, to a great extent, is that Netanyahu's policy for the last, I would say, at least 15 years, maybe even uh, 25 years since he got into politics, was to uh, continue the occupation and spread the settlements and build the apartheid regime in the West Bank through a status quo uh, 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 policies, meaning without creating too much noise, without creating too much friction, uh, uh, this was the idea behind Netanyahu's policy, and what is and he 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 actually said even in an article that he wrote in Haaretz just a few weeks before the election that the 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 peace for Israel does not pass through Ramallah, that we don't need Ramallah, meaning that the Palestinian issue is not relevant to Israel's uh, 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 future and present. Now, what happened to a great extent is that these right, very right wing, very racist religious uh, parties like uh, Itamar Ben Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich uh, 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 parties, these parties claim almost the opposite. They say, no, the Palestinian issue is the only thing that matters. There's not, nothing else matters. They spoke about their supremacy. They spoke about uh, the fear from Palestinian inside Israel, in meaning inside 48, and of course, over the, the, the green line. Uh, and, and we see it also in the agreement that they have signed with the Likud party after the election, all dealing with issues regarding the occupation. Smotrich took uh, Smotrich is the head of the uh, Jewish, uh, 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 the Jewish, uh, the religious Zionism uh, 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 party. He took over the civil administration over the Palestinian complete responsibility over it. He took over the settlements. He took over directly. Took over the legal uh, uh, issue of running the settlements. Uh, um, Bengvir took. First of all, the police and then the, the border police inside the West Bank. So they're two taking these issues. And this is because they believe that they can really uh, uh, try to, to, to win over the Palestinian. It's not going, it's not continuing the status quo. It's winning over the Palestinian. And I would almost say, that they are heading, they are me what they mean is really that they want a new confrontation 
a new violence that may eventually lead maybe to a new Nakba, meaning that there will be violence and then there will be chaos. And then with this chaos, they could do each, uh, things that would change completely the political map between the river and the sea. So this is really this is a big change. It's not it's not it's not a minor change. Now, having said that, it's of course much too early to say if they will succeed. There are many many obstacles on the way, uh, beginning from the army itself, who is not so happy to go into confrontation, full confrontation with the Palestinian, running over the Palestinian cities, things like that, the collapse of the PA. This is something the army does not want from, um, of course, the Palestinians themselves, whether inside the, uh, uh, Israel or certainly in the West Bank, the international community, the Arab state around it. So there are many factors that can uh, uh, form real obstacles to this uh, uh, new policy, but it's really going to the extreme to try and win over Israel's conflict with the Palestinians, something that we didn't see maybe, I don't know, for, for many, many years, decades. Thank you, Maron, for that um, background and for laying the ground in that way. Um, as a reminder for those who are joining us, um, this webinar is meant to be a moderate, moderated conversation um, followed by a Q&A um, guided by your curiosity. So for those who are um, with us, please feel free to go ahead and um, start dropping your questions in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and once we get through a round or two of questions with Amjad and Maron to lay the groundwork, um, we will turn to your questions. So Amjad, I want to actually turn to you um, and really, you know, your work and your analysis to date, particularly around the politics of Palestinian citizens of Israel or 48 Palestinians, has been really, I think, holistic in terms of understanding both the trends, um, what are we seeing within Palestinian communities within Israel in terms of how they're relating to elections and what their voting trends might mean for uh, Palestinian politics. Um, so if you can share a little bit with the audience about um, that, around how Palestinian citizens of Israel are relating to elections and what that might mean, and then specifically um, to Itamar ben Gavir and the, re the Religious Zionism Party um, and what that might mean for Palestinians, both within 67 and 48. Uh, thanks Ed, for that question. Um, and thank you, of course, for organizing uh, this discussion. I hope everyone can hear me okay, uh, it's coming through. Um, yeah, I guess um, to start off, just to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. So when we're talking about Palestinian citizens of Israel, we're talking about uh, Palestinians who specifically have Israeli citizenship and the right to vote, and we make up about 20% or a fifth of the population. Uh, so this is different from Palestinians uh, living in occupied territories who are part of the same people, but living are living under different sort of legal statuses, uh, residency rights, uh, etc. Uh, so I'll focus my my discussion on Palestinian citizens for now, at least. Um, now, since 1948, you know, Palestinian citizens have always had the right to vote. Um, and it's important to contextualize that this right to vote, you know, hasn't always meant that, you know, Palestinians in the, in the country live in a kind of democratic regime. Uh, on the contrary, there are numerous laws and policies that have been in place since 1948 that inherently make us second class citizens. And even though we can vote uh, for representation in the Knesset, and now we have much more, uh, let's say, political freedom or political parties to be able to run that represent the Palestinian community, they themselves are constantly facing attacks and attempts to curb their rights or to deter them from voting in many respects. There's a lot to unpack in all this, uh, but it's just to kind of put that into context because I know that the assumption that the right to vote can, can, can always equal political power in the state is, is not the case in many, many respects. Um, and in many ways, we actually saw this uh, in recent years. Um, so um, as I was describing uh, earlier, um, you know, what was once a kind of united political project for a couple of years broke apart. Um, over the past uh, couple of months. And this actually kind of affected voter turnout quite a bit compared to previous elections. Um, and 
and, and through that process, through the sp splitting of three slates, you ended up getting one of those parties completely falling under the threshold, um, which has completely kind of altered the balance in many ways. Now, in terms of how the community has responded to all this, uh, not only to you know this fracturing of the Palestinian parties, but also uh, to this massive victory of the far right, is that there's quite a spectrum of views and it's hard to gauge right now what that dominant view is. So on one sort of spectrum, very broadly speaking, you have a kind of cautious ambivalence, which is a very word, uh, very strange word to use. But to understand this, you know, you have to understand that many Palestinian citizens for the past decade plus have been living under almost unhindered right-wing rule. They have been experiencing Prime Minister Netanyahu and this increasingly right-wing governments for many years, passing numerous discriminatory laws and pushing all kinds of policies which themselves aren't uh, anomalies to how the Israeli state has dealt with Palestinian citizens, but they are certainly intensifications. Now, this could be seen as a bad thing on the one hand, but for many Palestinian citizens, there's also this feeling that this is nothing new. This is a, a continuation of a process that we've seen for a while and that we've been able to withstand and survive through our socioeconomic uh, uh, kind of clout, what, what, what clout we do have through some political pushback and being able to come up from the other side. Is, so this is kind of bro very broadly speaking, one area of, this, uh, of the spectrum to say that we can pull through this as well. Um, and there's some even saying, going further and saying that at least our right can help to maybe at least expose the regime and expose the Israeli political system and the full racism um, uh, of the system even more clearly. So you have these kind of views uh, sort of around one edge. But then there's the other kind of end of the spectrum, which is all out fear. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have, you know, in many ways, we have kind of survived the Israeli right, but we've also seen that when the Israeli right says they're out to achieve something, they tend to achieve it quite effectively and quite brutally. Uh, we see this certainly uh, against Palestinians in occupied territories, but this has certainly been the case with citizens of Israel. Um, since 2009, the flood of racist laws and discriminatory legislation has been immense, and they have really kind of uh, robbed away many of the rights that Palestinian citizens had fought for, you know, especially back in the 1990s when they made huge pushes for it. So there's very real tangible effects to this. And now that you have what's almost an uninhibited far-right government who are almost being given kind of a free reign to do as they wish, um, is something to be very alarmed by. And this is particularly the case for Palestinian citizens and uh, living in the Nakab or the Negev, where there's a large Bedouin community uh, who for many, you know, for many years have been under the threat of forced displacement and forced urbanization. This is very likely to, uh, to intensify precisely because people like Ben Gvir and Smotrich and religious Zionism have constantly and explicitly named the Nakab as a prime target. They see the, the Bedouin community as kind of encroaching upon land and kind of stealing the Nakab and building illegal houses, even though there's, you know, there's a whole story and packaging as to why they've been constantly dispossessed and are being refused even the right to exist in those communities, especially in unrecognized villages. Um, and also, uh, in addition to this, Palestinian citizens in what are so-called mixed cities, which were historically Palestinian cities, Palestinian cities excuse me, that through expulsion and uh, gentrification and other methods have kind of weeded out Palestinians and become Jewish majority towns. Uh, the cities like Haifa, where I'm living, uh, Yaffa, Lid, Romney, all of which experienced, uh, still experience Israeli kind of domination in multiple ways, but these kind of so-called mixed cities are also explicitly targets of figures like Ben Gvir. Um, he was among these kind of prime figures that was among many kind of inciting uh, Jewish militias, uh, Jewish settler groups to come from the West Bank to these mixed towns, often guarded and aided by the Israeli police to target Palestinian neighborhoods. Uh, here in Haifa, uh, during the May 2021 uprising, uh, even neighbor in the place like Haifa, which is kind of regarded as a city of coexistence, was heavily targeted. Uh, its Arab neighborhoods were heavily targeted. And Ben Gvir was, was a prime instigator on this, and has really used it as a major driver for his platform. So, these are just kind of very broadly speaking, just some variations of these kind of views, and it's too soon to tell how it's going to go. Uh, but my main message from these kind of spectrum of views is, on the one hand, don't underestimate what the far right can do. I think, like Maron says, like it's not just a kind of a cosmetic change. Is there are very real substantive uh, uh, shifts that can directly affect, dangerously affect Palestinian citizens, especially, not, not to mention Palestinians in the territories. Um, and at the same time, 
do not don't fall for the belief that ousting this government or ousting this current right-wing formulation is going to fix the problem. There are trends in Israeli society and politics that have existed far before Ben Gvir came to power, even before Netanyahu uh, came to power, but he, that he certainly kind of helped to open the gates for. Uh, but there are larger structures at play that go beyond just uh, who's, in who is in the Knesset, but also what is the ideology of the state and how it's been able to get away with increasingly racist and annexationist politics uh, for many for many years. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll pause here and hand it back to you guys. Thank, thanks for that. I'm just thinking that's a, that's a great way of understanding the different perspectives of the Palestinian community. Um, you mentioned in brief the kind of breakup of the joint list, that formation of the major four Palestinian parties that used to run to Knesset in different constellations and sometimes by themselves, uh, united in 2015 to be one platform that at some point became the third largest slate uh, to make it to, to the Knesset with 15 seats, um, a considerable win for Palestinian citizens. Uh, and that is broken up in these elections. And as we've seen was part of what um, led the, to, to the defeat of the anti Netanyahu camp, uh, in just in terms of the numbers. Right now, with that split and devastation in Palestinian unity in parliamentary politics, where do we go next? Where do Palestinian leaders uh, think they can be going to next with this political project, specifically around parliamentary politics? This is a very uh, tough question. and. Um... I think to start us off, I think it's important to kind of situate this conversation on the terms of Palestinian citizens, because I think a lot of the times, especially internationally and even in Israeli society, when people talk about Palestinian politics inside Israel, it's often framed around whether or not the Arab parties will either help or oust Netanyahu. Like they've just kind of put his pieces in this larger Jewish political game. And I think it's important Then, while it's certainly relevant and it's obviously operating in a big electoral scale, it's important to set it why, you know, again, why are Palestinian citizens voting for these, for these kind of parties? What do they do? What do they represent? Now, as you mentioned, the joint list, you know, had a very kind of mixed experience and there's a lot of, di you know, divergent debates and opinions about, about its experience, about um, its, uh, its tenure. But I think, broadly speaking, the joint list really, really represented a very rare project of unity, uh, not only in terms of the Arab parties inside Israel, but among Palestinians as a whole. When you take into account the, the massive fracturing of, Palestinian, of the Palestinian parties mm -hmm. like Fatah and Hamas and the almost dissolution of the PLO and a complete lack of direction in this wider national movement. And so to have for several years, um, political factions kind of put aside these, you know, these differences, some, some substantial, some petty, uh, and then to kind of try to organize on, the, on this front was very, very significant. Um, and just as importantly as that, you know, in addition to kind of, you know, I th think sort of challenging the political game a little bit, you know, by accumulating power for Palestinian citizens, the joint list also represented for the, for the first time, I think, a really united camp that was the only camp that could really claim to be the only true pro-equality anti-occupation camp in the entire Israeli political spectrum. There, that was only one camp and it was led by Palestinians within the Jewish state. And this is the kind of irony that the joint list, I think, posed not only to challenge sort of Zionist left parties about where they stood on liberal rights and democracy and occupation, but also for people abroad to understand where our politics were compared to where the Zionist political spectrum is. Now, with all that said, the schism that was created uh, first when the Islamist Ra'am uh, broke away from the joint list uh, over a year ago, and then when they split into the into the full three um, just in the past few months, the schism is not just a kind of factional uh, squabble. There's actually something very fundamental to it. Um, very broadly speaking, since the 90s, Palestinian political parties in Israel have kind of um, kind of mobilized around a certain consensus that tried to balance between uh, a more assertive Palestinian identity on the part of uh, citizens uh, in the state, uh, while also kind of um, uh, trying to achieve sort of their civic equality as citizens, while also fighting for or fighting against the occupation, and especially in, in the two-state framework, basically sticking to the Oslo sort of framework. And there's a lot of debates and nuances between this, but that consensus, for the most part, kind of held through for several decades, for about two, three decades. When the Islamist Ra'am split from that, 
they're actually providing an alternative model. They're saying, we're not only going to ally with the sort of cent uh, Zionist center left as a strategic aim in order to you know, dismantle the occupation or to achieve equality. We're open to allying with the right wing. We're open to allying with other parties in the spectrum. And this is a very fundamental shift uh, because it, what Ryan is kind of presenting is a kind of return to a quote unquote Arab Israeli model, a very integrationist approach that says we are willing to abandon our Palestinian or, you know, abandon as much as possible our Palestinianness in favor of a more Israel focused uh, center. Uh, Hadash Ta'al, which is uh, led by Ayman Udin uh, Ahmed Tibi, is still trying to preserve that balance between, you know, the Palestinianness, the equality, the anti occupation. But it's, it's finding that because it got the same number of seats as Ram, uh, both of them have five, it's no, you know, it's no longer carrying the same political weight. There's a huge uh, splinter there. And of course, uh, with the Tajammu Abalad, which failed to cross a threshold, uh, but did a very impressive job in trying to assert this third way that's saying that uh, we're kind of taking a more nationalist approach and we are no longer playing by the Israeli political game uh, in the same way as we used to, that we'll maybe search for a Knesset seat as a form of democratic uh, representation and try to, uh, as a platform, but that we want, to, we want this different approach. And these are three very different strategies and ways of thinking. Um, and so the question of like, where do we go from here? You know, I think that, I think they're kind of two fundamental things. Uh, the first is that there needs to be a very core understanding that the Knesset is not gonna be the provider of real equality or anti-occupation politics, not for Palestinian citizens who've always known this to some respect, but the fact that the joint list was the third largest slate in the Knesset and still couldn't really change the political game is very telling. Ram's experience in the government of change and being unable to really accomplish much is very telling. And so that needs to kind of shift to the second point about how do we think about the grassroots, which Bellad right now is trying to build up more grassroots campaign to think about how do we reorganize our community outside. But there are questions again, like is it providing the needs that voters are actually voting for these political parties? Like there are still concerns uh, and societal socioeconomic needs that are demanded which can't be provided just by the grassroots because we don't have the institutions for it. So there's a huge debate going on now. And I think, but I think those two um, sort of uh, question marks really need to be uh, interrogated. And I think time will tell and the community will interrogate more uh, about which, uh, which of those kind of uh, takes precedence in the coming months and years. Um, Jed, thank you so much for um, laying that out. And I'm, I'm hopeful that during the Q&A, we're able to pull on some of these threads around the role of the grassroots and where we're seeing some of that movement happening today um, and in recent years. Um, and on that same kind of thread, I actually want to go to you, Maron, um, as we talk about the anti-occupation camp in Israel. And I think Hagai earlier really laid out the anti-occupation camp, um, the anti-Natanyahu camp, those things being distinct and also sometimes overlapping, but certainly distinct. Um, and Amjad really bringing in this lens of um, kind of the Palestinian political parties really serving as the vehicle through which a call for rights respecting our equal equality based framework got put on the table. Um, talk to me about the Israeli anti occupation camp for a moment. Um, and the recent elections, I think, in many ways were devastating for that camp. Um, and so if you can talk to us about what does it mean? Um, have they been wiped out? Um, could they recover? And what do you think is the future of Israeli opposition to Jewish supremacy across Israel-Palestine? Uh, first of all, it must recover. Uh, um, yes, certainly with uh, you can, of course, discuss how much merits uh, really represented uh, a, a real fight against uh, Jewish, yes, they were against occupation, were, but were they really against Jewish supremacy and uh, Israel being defined, first of all, as a Jewish state? It should be questioned, but certainly the fact that they are out of parliament uh, is, is a blow, is a blow, first of all, for, for organization. Uh, uh, needs, you don't have the party, you don't have the funds that the party have, you don't, uh, uh, so, so it's certainly a, a, a blow. And um, yes, in generally speaking, uh, the, this camp, this anti-Netanyahu camp went to the election 
very, very divided to speak even about the camp is is very uh, uh, is very difficult. It was not really a camp. You know, you have this, of course, you have uh, you have Ballad that were saying we will not cooperate with anyone from any Zionist party. You had uh, uh, Hadash Tal, uh, the Communist Party, uh, saying, yes, we will cooperate, but under certain terms. We had uh, merits going against the occupation. We had uh, labor not really clear what they are doing and others only talking about uh, uh, the, polit the, the, the legal problems of Netanyahu. So it's not really a camp. What, did happen late in, in the after the election, and this is to be seen, uh, and it's really in in the making, is that this large anti-Netanyahu camp is turning somehow uh, uh, to a camp for preserving what they call is the democratic value, or at least the democratic institutions of Israel meaning the judiciary, the independence of, 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 of uh, the legal system, uh, uh, and especially the secular, the secular side of, of, of Israel that is being under threat because the same parties that we talked before, Smotrich and Bengvir, are also demanding uh, um, uh, to dismantle or at least to take over the the Jewish aspect, what it means to be a Jew in Israel, who is a Jew, and in this sense, for example, the, 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 there is uh, uh, an eminent, still not clear, attack on LGBT uh, B rights. Uh, there is a, 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 a deputy minister was going to be a deputy minister that is really his aim is to dismantle everything that has to do with the rights in Israel. So here, there's forming, there's a formation of this camp, that not. Already, you know, anti-Netanyahu is less important. Safeguarding this democratic institution is the issue. Now, of course, when these when people like Lapid or even uh, uh, Merav Michaeli or certainly uh, Victor Lieberman or Benny Gantz are talking about democracy, it's not the same thing as Amjad <laughs> or, or the Joint List or, or what uh, Hadash Tal or, or Tejam or, uh, or Balad are speaking. It's a completely different thing. But, uh, uh, and they don't see, I, I still don't think that People like Lapid see really the connection, or even if they do, they they are not ready to commit themselves to 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 unite this uh, a fight against uh, uh, the threat on what they see as the, on the democratic institution, and to join for real democracy, real equality between the relevancy and of course, and and in the occupation and the apartheid regime in the West Bank. So this. Uh, uh, connection is still not made, but whether the real protest that is building up, nothing has has been materialized yet because the government is not really officially formed, but the anger that is building up in this large camp that is fearful for its liberal rights, uh, this Jewish liberal rights, whether this anger will lead somehow eventually to see that these, there's no democracy without full democracy in Israel, without full democracy for Palestinians, without full equality and without ending the occupation. It's really very, very too early to say, but I think there is a chance. The anger, the anger that we have seen on this large camp uh, is something that we have not seen for decades. People from the heart of the establishment, like ex-Prime Minister Ehud Barak are talking about civil disobedience or even civil rebellion against this government. Now, of course, they're not saying we fight against it because they continue occupation. No, we are not there. But where it will lead to, it has a potential to, to have some real opposition 
for this racist government. Thank you, Maron. That, that's fascinating, and I'm sure more on that will come uh, from the Q&A. We're now opening the Q&A session. Uh, if you've not asked questions yet, you're welcome to do so through the Q&A feature. Uh, just one small note, we've been talking to Miron and Amjad. We were supposed to also have Natasha Roth Roland with us today, uh, who's an expert on the Israeli far right, uh, unfortunately, and an editor on 972 magazine. Um, unfortunately, the very last thing she had an emergency and couldn't make it. So I really recommend reading her um, articles on 972 to kind of catch up with what she has to contribute. Um, opening the Q&A session, I want to start with um, Itamar Benkvir. There have been a few questions about him the q &A, one of them from Nabil um, is what do you make of the UAE inviting Ben Gvir? Um, and how does that connect into everything we've been talking about so far? Uh, question to either of you. Um, I think, yes, uh, uh, I don't see that they have already invited him. Maybe there's something new, but uh, I, I've seen that he was in the reception in the embassy in Tel Aviv. Uh, yes, I think um, I think uh, the Emirates, and there was a, a visit by President Herzog to Bahrain just yesterday. I think they still want to maintain the illusion that there is a way to tame this government and uh, um, I think it's complete uh, illusion they have I'm an expert for Emirates uh, politics but I think uh, it could be uh, there are explanation for this but yes for Bengvir it's certainly very important to show that he is not a racist meaning that he's not he does not hate Arabs as Arabs. He just is against the wrong Arabs. There are the, the good Arabs and uh, the bad Arabs. And he is against the bad Arabs. And the bad Arabs, he can fight and even uh, deport because he had a plan. Uh, uh, and even the law that he suggested, uh, it's not clear if he'll try to pass it, that will allow him to deport those who oppose the, the regime. Uh, these bad Arabs and some bad Jews also. But uh, so, yes, for Bengvir, it's very important. And Amjad, unless you have, if, unless you want to jump in, I have another question coming for you. Uh, I may just add to that, uh, at least just to, I mean, first of all, we got, we have to understand the UAE's normalization with Israel happened knowing full well where Israeli politics was going, knowing full well that the occupation and apartheid are in place. And so, you know, Ben Gvir may cause a bit of discomfort to uh, these Arab regimes that are normalizing, but it's not gonna be the make or break. The only scenario where I see that potentially being much more difficult for the UAE to kind of, or make it, make it impossible for it to really kind of try to sweep over is if Ben Gvir and the new government really pushes things, especially around uh, Jerusalem and on the on the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif, um, because there, over the years there's been these increasing sort of um, uh, groups of uh, Israeli uh, settlers and or worshippers trying to get out to the Temple Mount in violation of an old status, you know, what defined like the status quo uh, on the mount. And under Ben Gvir, there's a concern that this is actually going to increase. And this is probably the, the only thing that a lot of one of the few things that the Arab regimes are most concerned about. Whatever the state does to Palestinians, I don't think will really affect it, but there is a much bigger question because it relates to a very important, uh, you know, um, the Islamic holy site as well as Jewish site, of course, um, and affecting most of the Muslim world. Uh, but for the time being, it's clear that, you know, the UAE is also echoing what the United States and Blinken, uh, Secretary of State Blinken recently even said that uh, we're gonna be judging the Israeli government not by its members, but by its actions as if there were no actions on which to judge it by from before. But, and so there, you know, there, there's still these governments trying to find this wiggle room to say that we're not gonna do anything yet. Um, and I think this is already kind of losing ground and trying to deter, to stop what's, uh, what's about to come. Thanks, Amjad. I'm gonna collapse a few questions in the interest of trying to get through as many as possible. Um, just to 
kind of equip our audience with information. Can you speak to the rights that Palestinian citizens of Israel are that we should expect to have rolled back under this new government? Um, if specifically, and then the second question, and it's related, I think, to your answer just now um, about the role that different countries are playing as they try to wiggle out of actually facing um, the reality of what Israel is head on. Um, I also want to offer this to Maroon to jump into is what are the best ways for international communities to help protect Palestinians given this reality that we've painted um, today around these election results and what they mean? Go for it, Amjad. Um, so in terms of the rights that will be affected, I mean, that's been ongoing for quite a long time. Um, if we take, for example, uh, uh, Netanyahu's return to power in 2009 and all the governments that have been around since, many of the discriminatory laws that were passed affected everything from land and housing rights. So there's like the admissions committees law, which literally allows uh, small towns and communities to segregate or, or, to, dis or to reject Arabs from, from, uh, from living in those spaces among other identity groups. You had, uh, you've had laws that kind of shrink democrat you know, certain democratic rights. So the anti-boycott law in Israel basically threatens to sue or can, can allow anyone to sue anyone who calls for, uh, who calls for a form of boycott against Israel, against an Israeli entity, et cetera. So this is really a very kind of stifling law that's, um, you know, that's restricting what little freedom of expression, not just Palestinian citizens, but also Israeli leftists have. Uh, and we're seeing these kind of laws all over you know, all over the world and Just Visions put out a fantastic film precisely about this. Uh, and there's a clear correlation. These aren't operating in separate vacuums. And those kind of attacks on free speech and those rare democratic rights, even to participate in nonviolent acts will be among those targets. You're seeing it in the United States and you're certainly gonna see it in many respects here. Uh, even now, if you have some of the far right politicians talking about even being able to try to come up with new laws and punishments for anyone who obstructs soldiers in the occupied territories with imprisonment of up to three years and an obstruction or provocation can mean anything. It literally means sitting down on the floor uh, in protest and then they can say, that's it, you're obstructing our work. So we really, you know, th there's a, there's a huge slide that, that, that this can easily go down on. Um, and of course, there's, uh, you know, there's laws that are very much in the spirit of the Jewish nation state law and uh, other provisions that can be added to kind of expedite the, the spirit of that law in terms of uh, insisting on Jewish supremacy and dominance. Just recently, the Israeli Supreme Court uh, heard the latest hearing uh, regarding a, the citizenship law, which basically bans Palestinians uh, or citizens of Israel from being able to kind of extend their citizenship and to marry and to bring in their spouses or children from the occupied territories. And this primarily affect, predominantly affects Palestinian citizens. What's gonna happen with that law, which is now under review for I think the third or fourth time now, uh, or whatever number it is now, like these are laws that can constantly keep getting worse and more stringent. And with the Supreme Court, uh, which has very much condoned actually a lot of these laws, the irony is that the right keeps think, keeps accusing the Supreme Court of kind of pushing against the right-wing's agenda, but on the contrary, when it comes to Palestinian citizens and Palestinian occupied territories, the court is very much kind of either allowing, enabling, or looking over many of these policies. They are very much a rubber stamp. Uh, but there's a difference between also being able to kind of still go to the Supreme Court and have a legal process to push back and fight against these kind of laws. Um, and then if we end up getting a situation whereby the Knesset does create this sort of override clause over the Supreme Court, those legal avenues will quickly erase. So we don't even have the ability to buy time to push back or to even use some legal methods, which obviously won't solve the problem, but can help us as a tool to fight. If that goes, that's also a huge weakening of the, of the community. So these are just some examples of where this can go. And uh, where, again, we've seen this trend for a very long time um, and it can only be uh, uh, surging through uh, with the fire government. Um, and for the second question, I think I'll hand it over to Moran actually about the international community, and what they could do. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to follow up uh, uh, with Amjad said about you know the uh, if uh, if the parliament, if the Knesset will really change the law so so it can oppose any law that uh, the High Court will uh, um, uh, will uh, cancel uh, that it will have the ability to uh, reenact this law. This may have 
as Amjad said, affect Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. Certainly, could be all kind of laws that up till now were not uh, were not uh, uh, have not gone through because they knew that the High Court will will disallow them. And now uh, will. But this also interesting in this intertwining of the the the, the liberal uh, Jews fear that these rules will change. So there could be some here of, 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 of a parallel, at least, uh, uh, fight against this. As for the international community, well, I think, again, uh, um, what Blinken said, uh, and uh, 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 it seems that the international community is waiting to see. But I have still the impression that the eye uh, is open more about uh, on Israel now. We have seen that even uh, in a very small incident where Itamar ben we went to memorial for Rabbi uh, Meir Kahana, just went for a memorial, very small event. And in, in a less than half an hour, I think, the spokesperson for the State Department said that this is, uh, uh, um, uh, this is shameful that he went there and that Kahana Chai uh, is a terrorist organization, that his organization is a terrorist organization, uh, implying that Ben Gvir is part of what it, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the American administration is considering a terrorist organization. So we have to wait and see. I have heard with interest the, the speech by Jeremy, um, uh, ben Ami in J Street yesterday, almost talking about conditioning aid uh, for Israel. That was interesting. He said that the U.S. has the laws that enable it to condition aid, uh, uh, and it must use them against Israel if Israel applies uh, racist uh, 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 policies, of course. It has already before, but still. So I think, uh, uh, I th and, and generally speaking, I think Netanyahu's room for maneuver is much less than it, it has. Be it were it had before. First of all, because of his uh, government that is so dependent on very extreme right, and on the other hand, uh, he played before with the cards of Putin on one hand, Trump on the other. Uh, Trump is not in the White House. To go with Putin is uh, does not uh, well so welcomed uh, today. So I think his room for maneuver is less. So I think yes, conditioning any kind of aid or support or cooperation with Israel uh, with regard to at least uh, the occupation and the enactment of real apartheid regime. And that is really the essence of the agreement between uh, uh, Bezal Smotrich and Netanyahu is really apartheid, official legal apartheid in the West Bank for uh, 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 the Jewish settlers versus uh, uh, the Palestinian natives. So yes, any conditioning there and it could be various institutions, governments, etc., is helpful. Thank you, Miron. Um, we're gradually running out of time. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, one of the questions coming from Josh is, uh, to what extent is Israel reliant on Arab labor, uh, on Palestinian workers? Uh, to what extent are Palestinian citizens integrated in the Israeli economy and workplace? Um, Amjad? I was actually thinking Moran can answer this because Moran and uh, Oren uh, over the past year or so have been actually uh, doing some very interesting reporting about um, Palestinian laborers uh, who kind of cross into Israel. Uh, the question was, uh, I think, about citizens, though. Oh, about citizens themselves. Yeah. Ah, because you're also together. Yeah. Do I think that's also actually a very interesting question regarding to Palestinian laborers from, uh, from the occupied West Bank? And you can, ask, you can answer both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how it kind of like breaks really, it really bre breaks this kind of myth of this uh, of uh, of separation or like you know what is separation in real in reality and practice? 
Um, I mean, we, I mean, first of all, Palestinian citizens make up a fifth of the, of the country's population. You know, and we really kind of um, cross through all kinds of, you know, all kinds of economic, socioeconomic sectors and all kinds of jobs. And that's changed, especially a lot over the past two, three decades as more Palestinian citizens have kind of entered the market or been, you know, certain openings in the economy have paved the way for them to kind of enter the market and to uh, build up more of a middle class as compared to previous years. And there's a lot to unpack as to why this was the case and how Israel has an interest in, in, in doing so and achieving this. Um, but this, uh, and I'm not a political economist, so I can't really speak with a lot of expertise uh, on this matter, but it's safe to say that we're obviously, in many ways, Palestinian citizens are quite deeply integrated into the Israeli economy in many respects. Um, you know, it's everything from small businesses to uh, you know, you know uh, the number of Palestinian citizens who work in hospitals and pharmacies. Um, you know, and Palestinians also trying to create, you know, trying to break through even the high tech sector. So there's a there's a very uh, you know complex and multifaceted um, uh, movement on all these fronts. Um, and, then, and it's been interesting to see that kind of growing socioeconomic power. And then these questions like, and this is part of the debate that's also operating, like how do you transform these socioeconomics into uh, political clout? And here you also see that reflected differently, for example, in the political parties whereby Ram is trying to have a more integrationist approach. Uh, and there are those who are you know, like Hadash Ta'al and, and even more so uh, Balad is trying to start like, how do we use this to also, you know, through strikes, through trying to, uh, create even economic prices on the state when they do violate our rights, um, and this is and this is quite a mixed bag because I think um, even though we're having this kind of increasing economic clout without a clear political direction of how to use that beyond you know sustaining our families, our communities, um, you know being able to provide even basic needs for ourselves, even if that is still you know, it's still not enough to meet a lot of basic infrastructural needs. There, uh, the budgets that Arab municipalities are getting are not sufficient, and especially compared to a lot of Jewish localities and even uh, Israeli Selmas in the West Bank, we're only getting a fraction of what, what we should be getting. So there is structural discrimination on those fronts as well. Um, but again, without a political direction of how do we try, to, what are we trying to fight for economically? How do we try to demand budgets from the state without having a conditioning upon our political pacification? Um, how do you relate this as well to Palestinians in the occupied territories? Because also a whole economy going on between Palestinian citizens and Palestinians in the territories, which doesn't get kind of always marked on your, you know, on the GDP record and stuff like that. Um, so there's an, and there's also like a black market that operates. So there, there, there's a lot of complex uh, aspects to all this. Uh, but again, it's like how do we use this to kind of um, to, to put the community back in the direction? It's still very hard to um, still very hard to say. Thanks, Samjad. Um, I wanted to jump in and, and start tying some of these threads together. And just to note on both Maron's comments on um, the international community's role on putting economic pressure on Israel, as well as I think Amjad speaking to uh, the various levers for economic pressure within um, uh, amongst Palestinian citizens of Israel, I think it's also important to kind of take a historical view where Palestinians have actually been using since the 1930s, um, since 1936, deep efforts to utilize economic means as a way of um, uh, holding Israel accountable until it complies with human rights laws. Um, and what you ended up seeing actually during the first intifada most recently was kind of the most significant uprising um, using general strikes, tax strikes, boycotts, um, kind of every tool in their disposal. Um, and that was in the late 1980s that we saw that um, kind of really take Israel to its knees in terms of needing to have to come to negotiations because Palestine Palestinians refuse to cooperate with the system. Um, one thing that I wanted to make sure that the audience understood was that in, um, in the 1990s, that shifted pretty significantly. So in the late nine, up until the late 1980s, Palestinians were both the primary export market, particularly in the occupied Palestinian territories and the primary blue service, blue collar kind of uh, service workers within Israel. Um, Israel understood that, that that created a dependency. And they realized that during the first intifada um, in, in since then, 
um, Israel has expanded its, its export markets externally, but also um, shifted its primary labor markets to Southeast Asian communities um, and beyond. And this does play a huge role in terms of um, why we're seeing increased calls by Palestinian communities to the international community to really ser seriously consider the economic levers that we have at our disposal through um, using our purchasing power like boycotts or divestment campaigns um, and calling on countries to sanction or condition um, Israel um, in its military aid and beyond. Um, and as we're starting to wrap, I think this is, you know, this question, I want to just appreciate the questions um, that we haven't been able to get to today. There are many. Um, and um, I wanted to invite all of you to feel free to um, to join us on our email list. Um, our colleagues will be dropping that into the chat box, both for 972 Advancement of Citizen Journalism and 972 Magazine, as well as Just Vision. Um, we'd love to stay in touch with you. Um, this is a really crucial moment on the ground. And I think part of the work I've been most proud of um, is really seeing the work of teams like 972 MAG, like Local Call, um, journalists, human rights defenders, and activists who continue to expose and bear witness and provide um, the kind of information that audiences around the world need to both understand what is happening and what our responsibility is in this moment. And so um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Hagai to offer a few closing words, and I know he's going to offer a few words um, or some space for Amjad and Maroon to also offer a couple of words as we say goodbye. So before, uh, thank you to Had, before turning this over to Amjad and Maroon for kind of final comments, uh, I also want to add both Just Vision and 972, two organizations and the two websites, uh, new sites that we operate, Local Call in Hebrew and Plus 972 Magazine are nonprofit, they're independent. Uh, and that means that we rely on your contributions to do the work we do. Um, we have friends that will be dropping the links for membership and donation uh, possibilities in the chat right now. Uh, do consider supporting us as you've heard from Iran and Amjad. We are looking at a very new reality. This is a long game, uh, not something that you can win in the short run and we need people like you, uh, excellent attendees, to uh, join us in this long process. Do consider supporting the work we do through these links. Um, with that, uh, final words, Miron, and then Amjad. Um, I think, yes, uh, we are in, uh, in front of very uh, uh, dangerous times. Uh, I think uh, what happened uh, in the last election, I cannot we cannot minimize the threat. Uh, first of all, for Palestinian, but also for all those that are for democracy uh, in Israel Palestine. Uh, at the same time, I think we have also to think to see the big picture, and I think if a regime like the Israeli regime, the regime of uh, of occupation apartheid puts all its hope on uh, 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 a violent uh, 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 rascal, I don't know how the name in English, Birion. Uh, 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 thug. Thug, uh, like Ben Gvir, and uh, a racist that takes his order directly from God, like Smotrich, I think Israel is not in a good shape. If it puts all its stakes on these two people, it's a sign that it's lost completely uh, uh, the way where it is heading to. Uh, two quick points. Um, I'm sorry that she couldn't join this, but uh, Natasha roth Roland, uh, our uh, fellow 972 editor, I strongly, strongly recommend everyone follow her and support all her work and her writing. Uh, like I was mentioning that she really is, I think one of, as far as I'm concerned, one of the foremost experts who's been following the Israeli far right, really knows how to kind of unpack and dissect the parties, the figures, the ideology. Um, and so I really wanna keep like, 
pushing her work. And I really recommend you all uh, read her, her latest pieces, some of her past pieces. She's been on our podcast as well. Um, so do, do look up her things. I think she really provides one of the most astute analyses of what we're facing right now. Um, and the final point is just to kind of emphasize more than ever that it's absolutely essential that everyone understands the urgency of the anti-apartheid movement in this in this current case. And as we were referring to before, you know, there's always been this assumption, there's been almost like an Israeli democracy project on one hand and a Palestinian liberation project on the other. This can no longer be the case. There needs to be a full understanding that there is one struggle, one regime, one system of oppression that is operating in many different, uh, very different sort of avenues and uh, with tools and aspects among Palestinians, but also in Israeli society, but it's absolutely vital that we unify this emerges and understand that the anti-apartheid movement has been articulated and led by Palestinians that we've been diagnosing this regime and where it's been going for a very long time with our allies and supporters. And the more that we can amplify that anti-apartheid movement and assert it and especially amplify Palestinian voices um, in, the, in that discussion, then we are really helping to shift that tide and to be able to act where we need to and to legitimize certain voices and provide agency or amplify the agency of those who are otherwise denied it. Um, so I hope you do that, whether you're in the United States or whether you're you know, in Europe or anywhere else in the world, in South Africa, you name it. Um, and, uh, and please keep supporting organizations like ours who uh, really are um, on that front line and one of the few independent organizations doing this kind of work. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Amjad, and thank you, Maroon. Thank you all for tuning in with us and for joining us for what I believe was a full and rich discussion. Several of you have shared that you want to share this webinar or listen to it again just to dissect the very rich comments um, that were offered. We will be following up to make sure that you all have a link of this webinar. It's also currently available on our Facebook page at Just Vision Media, um, and we will be in touch with additional resources. Stay tuned for future webinars like this one um, that provide both information and to the best of our ability and understanding of what we might need to be paying attention to as we keep forging ahead in the struggle for freedom, rights, and dignity for all. Thank you um, so much and have a good afternoon or morning or evening wherever you may be.